This paper is about contact-induced linguistic change. What happens, thank you, when the speech tradition of one group is changed as a result of contact and influence from the speech tradition of another group. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. Thank you. Well, the Philippines, you'll find a lot of this there, as we all know. Um, as a place for looking at aspects of language contact in the Philippines is superb. And it comes in many forms. The most famous form is the influence of Spanish and laterly, later on American English on languages of the Philippines uh, from north to quite far south. But there are previous sources of influence. Uh, for example, Hokkien Chinese has given words to a number of Philippine languages, including um, the Tagalog word for gold <coughs> is from Hokkien. And Malay has influenced some languages rather more strongly than others. Malay is interesting in this regard, not only because it provided a number of words to Tagalog and Cebuano that are themselves of Malay origin, but it acted as a conduit for words from other languages. Sanskrit, Arabic, Tamil, Mon Khmer words have come into Tagalog by way of Malay. Um, Sanskrit words preserve the aspirates of the Sanskrit originals in Tagalog, which they have lost in Malay. Uh, Mon Khmer has given words such as the word for twin, which is a twin myself, I'm quite attached to, um, and so on. And John Wolfe has written well on this. But there are other contact scenarios one can mention. The whole range of Spanish lexifier creoles, um, influenced by greater central Philippine linguistic typology, um, the ones found in and around Manila Bay, Tabinateño, Cabeteño, which is endangered, Ermiteño, which is no longer around, and also the Mindanao Chamacano varieties uh, in several cities in Mindanao, uh, most famous of which is uh, San Juan Genio. And these latter also have absorbed a lot more vocab from Philippine languages. You also get cases such as Cagayan and from Cagayan Seal, uh, a Manoba language that is profoundly influenced by Visayan languages and many words of Manoba origin in Cagayan and have been replaced by words of Visayan origin such as for example the verb meaning to know. So, what about in the north? Linguists such as Laurie Reed, already much and rightly mentioned in this room, and Bob Blust have shown that languages of the, of the Cordillera and neighbouring regions in Luzon have complex histories that are strongly marked by the effects of contact-induced linguistic change. And this is clearly evident in the realm of everyday vocabulary, the words we use in everyday sentences, in which a large number of concepts in many languages have been renamed with words that come from other indigenous languages. And in Luzon, the major providers of these words are, as we would expect, Ilocano, and latterly also Filipino. Though the traffic is one way. 
is a kind of Filipino, uh, Filipino may have influenced Gadang, for example, but the influence of Gadang on these languages is rather less strong. What can we say about borrowing in the languages of the song? I came up with three adjectives after thinking about it. Extensive, because it is. Profound, because it affects layers of the lexicon that one might not expect to be affected. And under-investigated. We can learn a lot more about culture contact, language contact, from the materials we have now than we have so far been able to do. There is a lot of history to be discovered from these. An example of this is the Arta language of Northern Luzon. Not much work has been done on it. I received word only a couple of days ago that a Japanese student is investigating this language. Previously, the source of information was a paper from 30 years back by Laurie Reed. And Laurie Reed gathered a word list of 512 items. And of these, he found that 131 items were words that had been taken from other languages, including words from Ilocano, which has not only donated words to Atta, but which may also be its closest relative. And 148 further words on this list are words that do not seem to have any relatives or cognates in languages nearby, including possibly the numeral for one, and certainly the numeral that means two. So, there are a lot of questions about the history of these languages, and a lot of them are answered by an application of certain techniques of historical linguistic methodology. We look at historical phonology, the way in which sounds in a language change their form or realization over time, and we look at data from high-frequency vocabulary, the commonest words, the commonest nouns, verbs, and so on. And quite often we rely on this information because we have very little else. So, here's an example. The group, which is now being called Pro proto northern Luzon, used to be proto Cordilleran, the ancestor of Ilocano, Montauk, and Pangasinan, and many other languages, changed proto Malay Polynesian <coughs> capital R to R. Words that come straight from there, from proto Malay Polynesian, have R. Contrast Greater Central Philippines, a construct that Bob Blust proposed in 1991, which contains Tagalog, Bicol, Bisayan, and a number of other languages, mostly in Mindanao. That took Proto Malayo Polynesian, capital R, changes it to a G. And anybody here who knows Ilocano? and Tagalog can think of examples. Words that are quite similar, except one has R in them, and the other has G, but they have similar meanings. And the occurrence of these correspondences in set after set of words of everyday vocabulary confirms this.
here's a partial subgrouping of northern Luzon languages. The southern Cordillera <coughs> omitted. You've got Mesa Cordillera or Central Cordillera, Ilocano, Atta, Northern Cordillera, language of the, of the Cagayan Van, uh, Valley, and another group which Jason Lobel and Laura Robinson called Northeastern Luzon. Dupaning and Agta, Palanan, Casiguran Dumagat, Paranan, and so on. Now, as I said before, some of these languages have a number of words that aren't shared with other languages. Some seem to be unique. And Laurie Reed, in an important paper of 1994, suggested that in some of these languages there is an underlying layer of words that predate <coughs> Austronesian arrival in the Philippines round about five and a half or five thousand years ago. Some of these words are more widespread than others. They're generally found in Negrito languages, in Black Filipino languages, in the Son. <coughs> Some are widespread. The word for rattan, for example, is found in at least four of these languages. Some forms are confined to a single language. So, do these suggest that before Austronesian speakers reached this part of the Philippines that there was a single pre-Austronesian language in Luzon? Possibly yes, possibly no, possibly a dialect continuum. We don't know. But this is the kind of information which helps us to understand and develop narratives of linguistic relationship and development. And I pay tribute here to the work of Jason Lobel and Laura Robinson, who have documented these languages in considerable detail over the past decade or so. And as I said, much of the information we have is lexical, it's vocabulary. Why? Because for many of these languages, we do not have any textual material. Linguists love texts. They like to dig through texts, put them in corpora, find out all you can about a language looking through texts. But for a number of these languages, we do not have any texts that we can address. So if we're trying to open up more of a picture of the pre-Hispanic history of Luzon and its peoples, we use what we have got. And here it might come in useful to talk a bit about strata. Substrate material from languages previously spoken by population. Abstrate material from linguistic traditions with which speakers have come into contact. Uniques are forms that are found only in one language. The logical component, the material that comes into a language from its immediate ancestors, which comes there again from its that's immediate ancestors, and so on, all the way back. What are we going to call this? Well, if we were creolists, we would talk about a superstrate. because this is often known as the genetic element of a language, though some linguists, including the Austronesianist Malcolm Ross, prefer the term genealogical element. This is the part that is inherited from the people 
who taught us our language and who inherited it from the people from whom they learned their language, <coughs> and so on. Super straight is not a happy term, so I put it in brackets. So, if we look at language historically as a, a set of strata, what do we find? Let's have a quick look at English. <coughs> West Germanic, that's a super straight, that's the genealogical element. <coughs> Tiny elements from British Celtic and maybe Latin, possibly about a dozen words and a larger number of place names, all told, as a substrate, as a language <coughs> spoken in England before the Angles and Saxons rolled in in the 5th century, and later acquired elements from Old Norse in the 10th century, Norman and Central French, Latin, Flemish, Greek, Arabic. <coughs> Take words like yo-yo and boondocks, you can throw in Philippine languages. These are all abstracts. English has a lot of abstract material, not a great deal of substrate material. Some languages do have a great deal of substrate material. Northern Luzon languages. Maybe 20% plus of the vocabulary on, on standardised lists is material from languages that we don't know the origins of. So it's the case of Arta, it's the case of Northern and Southern Alta, and so on. It may even be the case with Ilocano. And material from Southern Alta, again from Laurie Reed, <coughs> shows that you have abstracts in large number, but you ha also have a plentiful proportion of substrates and a number of forms inherited from Proto-Philippine and from earlier forms of Proto-Northern and so on. Many of the forms in Southern Alta are inherited from proto Philippine, but are not found in other languages which belong to the same branch as Southern Alta. It's conservative in some ways. And of course, this brings us to the question of languages of the Black Filipinos. Maybe 50,000 of them often known as the Gritos, or by reflexes of Proto-Philippine, Arta. All speak Austronesian languages. Some of them speak Austronesian languages of the, their own, that they don't share with other groups. And as I said, we assume that some of the elements in these languages go back to pre-Austronesian languages. There's a nice map. I have been very naughty. I've gone east of the Cordillera to look at the eastern coast. Do forgive me. So you've got Palawi Island at the top, all the way into Bicol territory there. And there are some other groups further south. Many days, a good example of a language with lots of activity in its several strata. 22% of items on a thousand word list recorded by Jason Lobel are unique to Many Day. And a further six show unusual changes in sounds or in meaning. Um, the word for neck, for example, is le s, which I looked at and thought it looks like the Indonesian word for neck. And it may be related, but the form of the many day word is surprising. Major regional language there is Tagalog, important loan source. If you want names for clothes when you're speaking many day, the words you use are of Tagalog origin.
another case depending on Agta, northernmost Agta language. Living in proximity to speakers of Ilocano, absorbed some Ilocano morphology, which it uses productively, so you apply it to words of non-Ilocano origin. And that some words of Ilocano origin, such as mapan, to go, mangan, to eat, coexist with Dupanang and Akta equivalents, and have been recorded in otherwise monolingual Dupanang and Akta discourse. Third case it's unusual. Kesiguran in language of, of Kesiguran town seems to be a conservative form of Tagalog with a large topsoil of lexicon from the na neighboring language Kesiguran Akta. So here we have a non Negrita language borrowing extensively from a language spoken by black Filipinos. This is not what usually happens. This is very surprising. But if we think about the history of languages in the Philippines, is it so surprising? Tagalog is a language of prestige now, but was it always a language of prestige? Did it have to make way for other languages at some point? Was it influenced by languages that had greater influence in areas where Tagalog came to be used? And something that raises the question in this regard is the Kapampangan stratum in Tagalog. Tagalog in many ways is a bit like a Visayan language that has a 10% injection of words from Kapapangan and is missing out on some of the typical Visayan words like gugma to love. The kinds of words that come from Kapampangan into Tagalog replace earlier forms. They replace labels that Tagalog would have had at an earlier time for the same concepts. They're not usually cultural borrowings, items of Kapampangan culture that Tagalog speakers took over. <coughs> Thus they're like the Norse elements in Middle and Modern English. Norse elements in Middle and <coughs> Modern English are nearly always now words that speakers of Old English would have had equivalents for. So, overall conclusions, Luzon is a hotbed of contact in news linguistic change. Ilkhan and Tagalog, major languages of power and prestige nowadays. Was this always the case? Some languages that have, or whose speakers have less power nowadays, have been able to exert influence on speech communities, which many sociolinguists would have taken as being more powerful. And such evidence should cause us to rethink our ideas. The way things worked now may not always have been the case. But of course we need to know more texts from these languages, people telling about what is important to them, describing things they see, describing things they do, and if they wish, describing things they feel highly important. More material of every kind on languages is always good, as any linguist would agree. I think Sergei would probably agree with me on this. And native speaker linguists. It would be great if the speaker of Mani Day was giving a paper on Mani Day here rather than a scruffy Englishman like myself. <laughs> so, 
thanks in abundance and in absentia to Laurie Reed, to Jason Lobel, and to you all for putting up with this. Maraning Salamat Sain Yong Lahad. migration was north to south, yes. then for the Philippine language to borrow from Malay, you're talking about back migration? No, this is, it's not back migration, this is to do with um, the power of sultanates ah. in 13th, 14th, 15th centuries. Um, there's a sultanate that came close to running Manila about a century before the Spaniards uh, hit the Philippines in, in Tondo, I think. Um, and it's cultural influence like that. It's, it's late in the day. It's, it's, what, it's in, a, it's in the, 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 the European Middle Ages and the late Middle Ages as well. Um, you talk about six or seven centuries ago. Yeah, but Malay is a simpler language than, say, Tagalog. Yes. So, as in the case of the Negritos, who like, presumably gave up their language for a more complex language, is that why they gave up theirs? Or, I mean, why, words, why would the Tagalogs in Manila give up their language for the simpler Malay language? It's, uh, just, it's just conquest? It just... They didn't, but uh, they were under a strong cultural pressure, prestige. Uh, Malay uh, Sultan kingdoms uh, trying to uh, govern Manila and also um, parts of the Visayas as well. Um, what, hap what happened is a, is a fact of Philippine history. The, I doubt that everybody at any time in, in Manila in, say, for, uh, 1450 could speak Malay or was ever going to shift to it. But a lot of people who saw the importance of dealing with the people with power would have known Malay as a second language and would have found it a useful source of new vocabulary. Uh, and as the uh, same in, in Cebu, I think the first record of Cebuano is Antonio Pigafetta's vocabulary from the 1520s. He survived Magellan's expedition and he also uh, includes a vocabulary of Malay that he got when he was uh, in Cebu. So the other thing is, uh, Ratan, if, if, if the Negrito migration was south to north, why does Ratan get retained in northern Philippines but it's lost in southern Philippines? I don't know. Um, every word is its own history and sometimes uh, they're not telling us what the history is. Um, perhaps it referred to a certain particularly durable kind of rattan that was useful for construction purposes and, uh, or for other purposes and, and became regarded as um, culturally or technologically important and, and, and the, the word stayed. Um, I mean the English word rattan is from Malay because we, we didn't have it and we had, we had to take the name of the plant together with the plant itself. Um, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.